Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us actually in our Square Crossing's first uh, program of 2022. Woo! Uh, it's uh, first lunchbox lesson, uh, the winter series. Um, my name is Katie Shoup, and maybe for those who don't know who I am, actually, this is my first program I'm doing myself. So that is exciting. Um, I've been at Square Crossing for actually almost exactly four months now, and I'm excited to deliver my first program here. So uh, I'm here today to talk about the broom corn industry in the Mohawk Valley. Uh, Gloversville, Johnstown has their tanning and leather. Amsterdam has their rug factories. Canterbury has beechnut. The broom corn industry was uh, Fort Hunter has their uh, broom corn industry. All right. Slideshow doesn't seem to want to go to the next slide. Nope. It will not let me go to the next slide. There we go. So, for those who may be not familiar with what broom corn is, it's a little different than uh, regular corn. Uh, it is in the sorghum family. It has stiff branch panicles and is used primarily in making brooms and brushes. Actually, uh, broom corn is different than sweet corn because it doesn't actually have kernels. It just has um, seeds at the end and actually a little what a uh, little sweep at the end that makes what broom corn famous for if you have enough broom corn you can make yourself a nice broom uh, i couldn't find any um definite time period a region where broom corn originated from some uh, there was where you it came in there like the nile river region there was evidence that it was started growing there first and then also I think I saw somewhere in the Yellow River Yellow River regime in China is where it was um, domesticated. Um, but actually in our neighboring county, Schenectady County, uh, room corn dates back to agriculture in 1812 with peaks between 1840 and 1880. It was the highest production of room corn actually in the state actually before the Erie Canal and westward expansion, New York State was a very high producer of room corn and Schenectady County being one of the counties. And go to the next slide, David. No. Here, let, let me see if I can. Oh, I can. I have access. Okay. So why the Mohawk Valley? Um, the Mohawk Valley was used for generations for settlement and for agricultural growth um, by the Native Americans before European arrival. Um, it has very rich fertile soils. The valley has a natural floodplain, which naturally turns the soil and make it nice nutrient dense soil for growing many different types of crops. This and one including is broom corn. Um, and also obviously with the Erie Canal, it was easier to make to transport and sell goods. 
in one of the many towns and cities that popped up along the canal. And the canal ran through all throughout the Mohawk Valley. So the with more towns and cities, there's more places to sell your goods and people to have help you and to grow goods. So that's why the Mohawk Valley was such a great place for food corn to be grown and for factories to come up. More population means more uh, cash and So I can't talk, start talking about the, oh, oh no. Nope. Yep, I can't, I can't go to the next slide again. Sorry about that. If you click enter, the picture should come up. There we go. So this picture is Ebenezer Howard. Uh, I can't really talk about the boom corn industry in Fort Hunter without talking about Ebenezer Howard first. He was kind of the pioneer entrepreneur who really made the boom corn industry in Fort Hunter. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about his background. Um, this actually, this is from the uh, history of Montgomery County by uh, Washington Frothingham. Um, according to this book, uh, Ebenezer Howard was born in Duanesburg and came to Fort Hunter for employment, much like other young men, young teenage boys came to different canal towns and cities to look for jobs during the booming Erie Canal days. And he actually found work at a canal store it wasn't, didn't say what kind of work he did, but probably helped unload cargo from the ships or helped people with their purchases in the canal store. And actually, at one point, he did run his own store on the canal before creating the going into business in 1859 with John D. Blood to establish the first room corn, corn factory in Fort Hunter. Uh, John Blood had his own farm, so maybe he grew good, was able to grow room corn and able to make a establish a firm, Blood and Howard, the first factory in Fort Hunter. Um, and they were in um, business together for almost a decade, over a little over a decade, um, until 1870 when Blood backs out of the firm and actually goes back to Amsterdam, where he was originally from. Uh, so Howard was on his own for the broom corn factory. He does his best, but until 1873, when unfortunately the original factory burnt, but uh, Howard pursues on, continues the business and rebuilds and grows company actually into the uh, American Broom and Brush Company, which is a very profitable broom corn uh, company. And he has the business, runs it for himself until his, though his nephew, A. Avery, and his sons, George A. and Charles L. Lee Howard, um, come into the business with him. And actually, it's recorded that um, from the Amsterdam Daily Recorder that on August 17th, 1886, the, his nephew and sons go into the business and it is no longer just Howard & Co. It is now E. Howard & Sons, which may be what more people would know the factory from as Howard & Sons. Uh, Howard was a very um, distinguished person in the area. He was also the, for a number of years, the director of the Farmers National Bank and also had other interests in local Amsterdam businesses until for his unfortunate death in um, 1892. And then it's Charles L. then is the runner of the company. 
Uh, next slide, please. So these are the the the, the broom corn factory on um, Main Street in Fort Hunter went through three different uh, companies. Obviously, the first one, uh, Ebenezer Howard ran. Um, I don't have pictures of, I mean, uh, pictures, obviously, um, dates of what these pictures were from. I like really didn't, in our collections, it didn't say where the, what, these dates were, but um, knowing when the factories changed hands, we kind of get a little bit of what these, um, the dates of these pictures are. Um, but Charles L. ran the factory in Fort Hunter uh, under the Howard name until 1901. And then he sold it to Fred C. and Charles Whitmere's. Uh, the Charles actually left the the factory in Fort Hunter to build a bigger factory in Fort Jackson, still under the American Broom and Brush Company. And then he builds a much larger, uh, bigger factory because the company ran out of um, room in the original factory. Uh, Charles, no, the Whitmere brothers actually um, converted the factory from steam power to electric power to more modernize the factory and then um, ran it for almost until 1917 when they sold it to Fred H. Bonney, who operated the, the Premier Broom and Brush Company in Amsterdam. But unfortunately, their, um, his factory burned in Amsterdam, and that's when they came over to Fort Hunter to keep, the, keep up their business. Um, and actually, Fred H. Bonney and his um, relatives were the last um, people to run the factory until it, um, I'll talk a little bit about this later on, until the factory eventually closed in the 50s. Uh, next slide, please. So the making process is actually a very long and kind of uh, what's the word prestigious uh, process more than what like to hand make the brooms how they're making it was very it took it took a lot of hands to make the brooms um, but we know what they actually in the Next slides, I have label, I have pictures of labels, and we know what kind of brooms they made. They made whisk brooms, deck brooms, and um, parlor brooms. And actually the deck brooms, we know that they were used and sold on the canal for the canal boats to help clean the probably very dirty and um, dusty uh, canal boats. But Okay, we have a interview um, recorded by um, from James Downing, and actually James Downing was the last owner of the company, and he actually eventually he ceased his operation. He was a former employee under um, actually Fred H. Miller's um, Bonnie's nephew's brother-in-law, and um, he. When it like to detail talked about what the factory was work was like and actually gave very good detail on, on what the process was of making the brooms in the Fort Hunter factory. So I'll tell you what he said. Um, so he says that the bales of corn were brought into the factory and opened. On benches, the corn were sorted by hand, fineness and strength and length. Each bench was equipped with a clipper. And the corn was clipped to one of the approximate lengths required for brooms and brushes. The corn was then run over a hurl cutter. And actually, that's um, important because one of the labels we have that they made hurl, hurl whisk brooms. So that's probably where that name came from. Which seems from its downing description have been rough analogous to a heckle in flax preparation. 
The corn is lined up by this machine and finally cut into one of six exact lengths. Next, the corn is taken to a jumper. This machine, which had a screen and an, an eccentric mechanism, separated the fine corn from the coarse corn. The corn was then tied into bundles about 18 inches in diameter and carried up to the second floor. Here it was dyed green, then carried back down to a bleach house. The corn was piled in the bleach house for 12 hours with the sulfur burning in a smudge pot. This bleach, this bleached the corn to a pale green. The corn was then carried back upstairs to the winders where it was wound onto the handles. Next, it went onto the sewing machines where it was sewn and shaped. The final process was 12 hours in the dry room at 220 degrees. The broom or brush was then trimmed, labeled, packed, and shipped. So it took, there was a very long process from getting the brooms, getting the broom corn, to eventually finally making it a final product of brooms being ready to uh, be sold. Actually, I think it would be fun to learn how to make a broom the old way, but it was a very long, hard process to make um, and make their brooms, but they did it. And actually the next slide will they'll kind of show what kind of broom, the brooms that they made. So next slide, please. Now this, <laughs> this is my favorite photo that I, in all the research and stuff that we have, this is also from the um, James Downey collection photo. And I just, I love this photo because it shows the brooms, it shows the makers, the factory in the background, and actually the man right in front, that's um, old, that's Ebenezer Howard. So actually, so we know at least this photo was um, pre-1892. Um, and the more, <laughs> I look at this photo, the more you see, there's um, actually right to the, to the right of Ebenezer, there's very intricately handled um, brooms. I didn't realize that they made um, brooms with such um, fine crafted handles. I thought they, they would just have made like the standard um, brooms, but obviously, actually that's also important because uh, the labels that I'll show have numbers on them. And I think the numbers um, depict what, how the quality of the room, I think the higher the numbers, I think the highest number is 10. So 10 being the higher quality room and zero being a lower quality room. But this, this, I just love this photo. It's just a great photo depicting of a 19th century factory and the workers and I just it's my favorite photo. I just I love it. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, I think this is probably one of the older um, labels we have. We have a whole binder here at uh, at um, Square Crossing full of labels that would have been glued on to the brooms. This is actually for one of their um, whisk brooms. And actually, like I mentioned this before, this um, hurl whisk brooms that was um, part of the process was putting it through a hurl cutter. Um, and this one doesn't say a number on it, but I just, it's just um, kind of like the modern advertising you would, if you wanted to know where you got that um, broom from room from, you had to save your label so you know where to get it from the next time you need one. Next slide, please. Now this is, uh, I think the next, um, these next labels are all from um, Premier Boom and Brush. This is actually when they were in Amsterdam. And obviously, as you can see, um, comparing it from the previous ones, one's much more uh, detailed and more colorful, and it shows the kind of room you're getting and just the 
the woman has it just I'm a, I'm always curious of how they died these um labels, but just the fact that this, these labels are like a hundred years old and how um preserved they are and just the bright vibrant color of these labels. Next one, please. Now this one, this one is like one of my um, favorite labels that we have. It's just the sun in the background. It's you know you you look at um, these the names, Little Princess Ray, and you kind of wonder what how they what made them come up with these names of these brooms. But it's just um, I think these obviously a higher um, end broom with it being a number seven and just trademark next to this one. It says it's. Um, Copyright um, 1913. So this is uh, during the uh, early 20th century broom label. And I just, it's just a great like advertising uh, piece. Next slide, please. So this one is obviously much less intricate and detailed than the others. And you can um, tell from the Number it's just a uh, zero. It's not the as a high quality of broom, but it's um, still this is, this is from when uh, Premier uh, leaves Amsterdam and goes um, to Fort Hunter. But it's still uh, these li these labels are all just like cool just to look at and um, kind of like a piece of history that you you can you can kind of see. <laughs> Next slide, please. No, this one, this is for their um, parlor rooms. This room that this label would have been on probably would have maybe just sit by the mantle or by the fireplace and uh, a broom you would want to. It's a, also, it's a number 10 you want to display in your house, but also have the functionality of a broom and just the Inter the intricacy and the of, I like the detail of the flower and kind of make it oh and like the parlor it's uh, the nice <laughs> a nice room for your house. Next slide, please. So the room factories coming in from this era are coming in during the um uh the second industrial revolution um this post uh civil war era of industry and commerce and the railroad industry and increase in communication and westward expansion all help create um a better more thriving industry and uh, with the railroad coming in Obviously, there's a change in the um, when the broom corn can be grown. More broom corn is then being shipped from areas like Kansas and Illinois out in the Midwest, then grown here. And there's also this the the changing workforce with more people. The factory work was more steady and more. You could actually, you knew you were going to get paid other than um, farming. You're kind of hoping for the for good weather and it's more hard labor. And also then in this time, there's also the labor strikes, labor laws, and labor unions. And I think if you saw in that picture that I, um, that James Downey picture of the front, there was, um, Four kids, there's actually evidence of four boys at the who worked at the factory. So there's um, child labor laws and stuff during this time, and a um, with more industry coming in, there's uh, and bigger power, higher powers, um, people. There's this whole boom, and that's kind of. It came, the factories came at a, the right time for um, for their growth. Uh, next slide, please. 
So this is the, um, so there was a union. It was the um, International Broom and Whisk Makers Union. Um, it, and there was evidence that the factories in uh, Fort Hunter and Amsterdam and in the area were part of this union. Um, it was it was registered in 1893, and it was the largest um, broom and uh, whisk union in in the nation. Uh, and actually, what is there is evidence of how large the industry, the broom corn industry, was in this area. Was that the um, official broom makers union journal was actually published in Amsterdam. So that is just evident of how powerful the um, and large the factories were here in the um, Mohawk Valley. And that's the unions were advocated for pay, safety, and rights, but they could also um, were very powerful groups that if you weren't a part of the union, you were going to, um, in many cases, there's evidence that of losing your job. Actually, in the from news article I found on Fulton Search from Glens Falls Daily Times reported that in 1886, 15 men quit the J.H. Bronson Co's in Amsterdam in order to compel a discharge of non-union workers, and they they won the so and so if you were not part of the union, you had to you they either lost their jobs or had become part of the union. And actually in one of the um the one the article here on the bottom right, it says in accordance with the action requested by the Amsterdam Brewmakers Union, the Retail Grocers Association of Troy has ordered to sell only union made brooms. So if you unions were great part of with making sure there was pay and uh, set hours, but also if if you weren't part of the union, <laughs> you had to, you weren't brought a job and they weren't going to, in, in, in evidence in Troy, they weren't going to sell your brooms, sell your products. So the union is, so it was good, but it was, there was also um, parts that um, if you didn't have a, if you were not part, you were going to not have a job, but that's, that was part of the, this whole industry unions, you know, this um, second industrial revolution, this, the change in the atmosphere of work and labor and the, the factories in Fort Hunter and Amsterdam were um, also just a part well, a part of it as well. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. So there is oh, so is there's this gap in um, in between where the factories. Um, in Fort Hunter, it kind of ceased and in from like modern broom making. And I mean, the factory in in Fort Hunter, James Downing, he he buys it in 19, I think it was 1952, and he ceases operation of the factory. The factory was not up to code. It was things were falling apart. The there was just not the need for the factory anymore. And he actually, he ceases operation in, and he actually, so he sells the equipment and just uses it as a um, storage for his own, um, for his own products and stuff. But then eventually the, I think the factory was torn down in the, I think it was in like the late seventies early 80s is when the factory was torn down, but there's this gap in history between when there wasn't a need for the um, factories and that kind of work anymore to people bringing it back. And actually there's um, lots of local craftsmen and artisans that have 
bought old equipment that was used in the factories in the valley and have brought um, handcrafted um, brooms back. And the images that I have here are just images that I, I found online of these are brooms that people, artisans are selling and they're using the hand powered old tools to make these brooms. I think this has come, it's come back because people want that um, knowing who's making the product you're buying. I think people enjoy that, enjoy seeing people like that fairs and stuff, seeing people hand make these brooms and that they know that they'll last and there's a quality to them. And I think also with the internet coming into in the in past like couple of decades, knowing that there's um, the site on sites in it, like Etsy and other sites, um, uh, individuals can start, can more easily sell their products to people. And I mean, these brooms are, are gorgeous. I mean, some, some of these brooms, I don't think I would use for a on the far right, just the handles, how intricately um, polished and um, just the, they just look like high quality brooms and that's just what um, you can go, you can look up broom making on the internet and there's so many people who have, um, artisans that have gone back to making, making sure that the, and making um rooms is still alive it's there keeping up there and some people their families they know they have evidence that their families um members were in the factories they made handmade rooms people were making handmade rooms for centuries and it's just a um, a great it's it's great that this um, industry is still alive and somewhat in these artisans who have decided to keep up the art of brew making. So if you go to the next slide, please. So um, I guess that is, that is my presentation. Um, I had a lot of fun with this project and using the already done research, but also um, research that um, I also did on my own was great. And, and I was looking up old newspaper articles and uh, use, using the parts of the collection that we have at Square Crossing to make this project possible. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, if there are any uh, questions, um, that were typed during the program. Um, I'd love to try and uh, answer them. Oh, and actually, um, this um, last image part of a label. Um, I guess you could say it's part of a where a, um, or it's an order form. It's a header for an order form and it just, you can, I love how it says like the, the jobbers of group corn <laughs> handles and supplies. <laughs> yeah, that's what they, they, they call themselves <laughs> jobbers, <laughs> but just the, the detail and in, in the intricacy of like the flowers and the, of the typing, you can tell they, um, put a lot of hard work into making their, um, not not only their order forms, but their um, room, their brooms as well. So, if there are any questions, yeah, Kate, there was a question that came in from Chris, who was asking if the Widemeyers uh, related to that family. 
that also ran a broom factory in Schenectady. I don't know if you came across that in your research. Oh, um, I did not come across that. No, I mean, I know obviously there was, um, other factories, but I'm not, I, I did not, um, no, I didn't, um, see that in my looking up. I mean, uh, when I found like the names of the people who ran it, I, you know, I searched that I, I did that, that them having a factory in Schenectady did not, did not come up. No. If anybody else has any questions, please put them in the chat. I, I think that uh, this question that he gave uh, would lead to a very good opportunity for additional research on part two or part three of these kind of a series. Maybe some demonstrations later on. We've had a little further discussion here in the office about that. So for those of you that have tuned in, that uh, hopefully will be something that comes up. And uh, in the chat, I did drop. Uh, a few links to some blog articles that we have about the boom factories. If you want to read a little bit more or read a little bit more about some of the strikes in the boom factories, you can do that as well. Um, but if you have some questions, put them in the chat and I will pose them to you too. Not seeing any other questions, so Katie, I'll let you wrap it up. Oh, all right. Um, thank you all for um coming <laughs> to this um first program of 2022. Um I had and like I said, I had a lot of fun doing the research for this project. Um and also this um this has been recorded. So if you know if anyone else who um wanted to tune in, but couldn't come for live. It'll be posted on to YouTube in a few days. So thank you all for coming.